every residential school survivor got a financial compensation. But in order to get that financial compensation, had to sit in front of a government panel of people and they were asked four questions. What was life before residential school? What was life after residential school? What was life during residential school? And what is one thing you tell a Canadian to make sure this never happens again? And in order to get us financial compensation, they had to bring those old stories up and they were terrible stories of what they experienced. And because of that, every one of us now have 94 calls to action. It's now our responsibility to implement those 94 calls to action. Because the authors, they're the ones that we can't go back and say sorry, but we can show their kids and grandkids that we're going to get it right this time. Welcome to The Scare is brought to you by Racer Co. I'm Sky And I'm Talitha. We are proudly broadcasting from Treaty 4 territory and the homeland of the Métis. In each episode, we tackle the alarming, inconceivable, questionable, shocking, and scary statistics relating to, impacting, and intervening with the lives of women and girls worldwide. We'll hear the scary truth, take away tools and tips, and learn about what you can do about it. And the series is an opportunity to raise awareness, share resources, and collectively use our power as women and supporters of women to make real change. We'd also like to know that the views expressed on this podcast are solely our own or solely those of our guests, and um, it's for entertainment purposes only. Also, some of what we share could be triggering to you, so please listen with caution. As straight, cisgender, white, able-bodied settler women, we are aware of the privilege that we have, and we want to use this platform to spread awareness about the scary reality that women from around the world face in different life situations. And why? Because sometimes nothing is scarier than being a woman. Hello, Scaries fam. Welcome to episode two of season two. Woohoo! So I don't know about you all, but in Canada and here in Saskatchewan where we live all year round, but specifically at this time of year, a surrounding National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, um, also known by many or probably most as Orange Shirt Day, we are very much reminded of the intergenerational impacts of residential schools on Indigenous families and communities the cultural losses and abuse suffered and the pressing work that our community still needs to do mm -hmm. for healing, reconciliation, and increased education about the legacy of residential schools. So the goal with Truth and Reconciliation, as we'll chat more with our special guest today, Cadmus Delora, is about first acknowledging the truths of our history, of which many of us were not taught about as children. I know I wasn't. And then committing to do better or reconciling our ways Uh, and our relationships with Indigenous people so this history never repeats itself. And we do that by reviewing and understanding and enacting the 94 calls to action towards truth and reconciliation and the 231 calls to justice. There's lots of work to do. There's lots. It's like, I don't know how many. I'm not <laughs> plus 231. I don't know how much that is. I'm yeah. very quickly, but that's a lot. Um, and believe it or not, this abusive history is not fully behind us. So yes, a lot of it took place in the past, but we're still facing a genocide of Indigenous people, specifically Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit individuals. Uh, this is widespread all across Canada. And because of this, on top of the 94 calls to action, which are Canadian, there are 231 calls to justice, like I mentioned, for missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people. Mm -hmm. And that's why on the heels of National Truth and Reconciliation Day uh, on September 30th, October 4th, a couple of days later, marks National Day of Action for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Girls and Two-Spirit People. So in today's episode, we will explore the background and the purpose of these calls to action and calls to justice and look at the progress our country has made so far and discuss what we can start doing now to ignite, expedite, and make justice for all Indigenous people, especially women, girls, and Two-Spirit People. It's possible. We have just some work to do. Yes. But before we can fully understand the full context of all of this, let's rewind the clock to first recognize the impact of settler colonialism going back to 1492 when a certain someone sailed the ocean blue. Uh, that's when Christopher Columbus arrived in the New World or discovered the New World at San Salvador in the Bahamas, a place already inhabited by Indigenous peoples. 
First Nations, Métis, and Inuit women, collectively known as Indigenous women, faced then and continue to face now many challenges due to the long-term effects of colonization. European settlers imposed a patriarchal system, which replaced the traditional matriarchal structure that existed in many Indigenous cultures. The Indian Act of 1876 further harmed Indigenous women by excluding them from the decision-making roles in their communities and stripped some of their rights. Despite these challenges, many Indigenous women today are leading efforts to heal from colonization's impacts, including dealing with issues like residential schools, violence, and addiction. Another key date in time is 2008, (laughs) when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada was officially established on June 1st with the purpose of documenting the history and lasting impacts of the Canadian Indian residential school system on Indigenous students and their families. It provided residential school survivors an opportunity to share their experiences during public and private meetings held across the country. Let's be real, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but provided them the opportunity, which they basically had to do in order to get paid um, yeah. for these experiences and have some type of restitution. They had to share and name what had happened to them in residential school that unearthed all of that trauma Yeah, in order for them means. to have any kind of restitution, which yeah. is very wrong, problematic to say yes. the least. The uh, TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, emphasized that a priority was displaying the impacts of the residential schools to the Canadians who have been kept in the dark from those matters. I frankly, like, I remember in school learning kind of, like, I have this vivid, I have this memory of, like, learning about residential schools, but how they were, like, so good. Like, everyone was getting on board and being educated, and it was, like, a great thing. Mm -hmm. Not the absolute terribleness that it is. I feel like I always equated residential schools to just reserves and the schools that were on reserves. And that's Mm -hmm. where the if you lived in a reserve, you went to a residential school. But I didn't ever get the all the details, of course, um, of what actually happened there. And obviously, those are two different things. So, yeah, very much. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, so five years later, after 2008, on September 30th, 2013, Canada first recognized National Day for Truth and Reconciliation as part of an effort to educate Canadians about the atrocities committed against Indigenous children at residential schools between the 1830s to 1990s, which is technically in our lifetime. I know, which is so scary. Yeah. This day is often referred to in schools and by many as Orange Shirt Day, which was inspired by author and residential school survivor Phyllis Webstad after she shared her heartbreaking story at a St. Joseph's Mission Residential School commemoration project and reunion event in the spring of 2013. So I don't know if many actually know Phyllis's story. I know we all know this idea of this orange shirt and right. wearing orange shirt day to represent uh, what this is. But let me just share her story. And it's pretty brief. So while living in Dog Creek Reserve in British Columbia in 1973, six-year-old Webstad was gifted an orange shirt by her grandmother to wear for the first day of school. Sadly, when she arrived at St. Joseph's Mission Residential School, her clothes were taken from her and she never saw that orange shirt again. She says the orange color has always reminded her that and how her feelings didn't matter, how no one cared and how she felt like she was nothing. Uh, She said, all of us little children were crying and no one cared. And for her, just just thinking about this, for her, the orange shirt represented a piece of home and a reminder of the traumas and experiences that came after. The shirt also served as a symbol of culture, freedom and self-esteem that was stripped away from indigenous children for generations at the hands of residential school. Terrible. (laughs) So fast forward a couple years after Orange Shirt Day entered the scene in June of 2015, The TRC released an executive summary of its findings, along with 94 calls to action regarding reconciliation between Canadians and Indigenous peoples. The commission officially concluded in December of 2015 with the publication of a multi-volume final report that concluded the school system amounted to cultural genocide. Mm -hmm. Then, the following year, the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls began in 2016 and concluded with a final report and calls to justice shared in 2019. Now, on the calls to justice, the National Inquiry investigated and reported on the systemic causes of all forms of violence against Indigenous women and girls, including sexual violence. 
It examined the underlying social, economic, cultural, institutional, and historical causes that contribute to the ongoing violence and particular vulnerabilities of Indigenous women and girls in Canada to this day. And if you listen to other episodes that we've done around interpersonal violence and all of those things, you will know that Indigenous women are disproportionately, extremely disproportionately facing violence over any other group. Yeah. Uh, of women in in the and I think still more than like two SLGBTQIA and disab- and disabled women like they are yeah. hitting it the most. So this is a huge huge problem. We'll get into more of the stats later, but it also examined existing institutional policies and practices to address violence, including those that are effective in reducing violence and increasing safety. So while the form of the formal name of the inquiry was the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. The mandate covered all forms of violence, such as sexual assault, child abuse, domestic violence, bullying, harassment, suicide, and self-harm. Overall, the calls to justice are aimed at ending this genocide, tackling root causes of violence, and improving the quality of life of Indigenous girls, women, and 2SLGBTQIA plus people. Mm-hmm. So while generally new and slow progress, I mean, this is about five years old now, mm-hmm. there have been some positive steps taken lately. Specifically, May 3rd of this year in 2024, the government of Canada and Manitoba announced a partnership to co-develop a pilot red dress alert system with Indigenous partners, supported by $1.3 million invested through the 2024 budget. The purpose of those alert systems is to help ensure that when an Indigenous woman, girl, or two-spirit or gender diverse person goes missing, they have a higher likelihood of going found. So, I mean, it doesn't prevent them from going missing, but it helps them to be Raises the alarm, though. Yes. So also this year, about a month later, on June 3rd, it was officially the fifth anniversary of the final report uh, from the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. This five-year anniversary did provide the opportunity in which we're going to get into for a light to be shone on the clear progress that was made or not made uh, towards the calls to justice so far. So we'll get into that next. Mm -hmm. So the stats. Obviously, before we get into what's being done, let's first t- take some time to understand the gravity of the situation to truly see the sense of urgency behind these calls to justice and treat them as legal obligations. So here are some rapid fire stats about missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people in Canada. And I know we did a trigger warning, but this is another trigger warning. <laughs> Uh, So according to Canada.ca's 2024 data, Indigenous women, girls, two-spirit, and gender-diverse people are extremely overrepresented as as victims of violence in Canada. Between 2009 and 2021, the homicide rate among Indigenous women and girls was six times higher than among non-Indigenous women, as reported by Stats Canada. And as we always say with Stats Canada... That's just what's actually right. What's said. actually on paper, but a lot yeah. of things aren't even yeah phrased, it reported. Or, yeah. yeah, according to a 2021 report released by the RCMP, 1,017 women and girls identified as Indigenous were murdered between 1980 and 2012, a homicide rate roughly 4.5 times higher than that of all other women in Canada. In addition, the report states that as of November 2013, at least 105 Indigenous women and girls remained missing under suspicious circumstances or for undetermined reasons. And to make matters worse, police in Canada do not consistently record the Indigenous identity of victims of crime. Statistics Canada reports that in 2009, for example, police failed to note whether the victims of crime were Indigenous or non-Indigenous, in 384 out of 610 homicides. Mm. Some victims of crime are being inaccurately identified as non-Indigenous because police have not had proper training on why accurate identification is important and how it is to be determined. Indigenous women are also more likely than non-Indigenous women to face violence from people they know. The rate of homicide by acquaintances was seven times greater for Indigenous women and girls than for all other women in Canada. I know we covered that in a very yes. first episode, yeah. but yeah. And that's why a lot of times when you hear the rates of um, domestic violence, it's a lot of Indigenous women because it's people in their family. It's, yes. it's in their homes. It's their their spouse or their uncle or whatever. Yeah. So it's just, ugh. yeah, it's a lot. So with all that being said, I know we're all on the same page that change is mandatory. Mm-hmm. 
These statistics cannot continue to go on or get worse year after year. Change must be made and legal action must take place. So let's get into how far we've come with that change as a country. So there's always many sides to a story. So first, we're going to talk or look at what the federal government reports that they've done and the progress they've made, um, highlighted in their latest 2023 report called the Federal Pathway Annual Progress Report, specifically speaking to the progress they made in the last year. So in 2023, uh, responding to the National Inquiry's call for justice. So Number one, to prevent violence and respond to immediate needs, federal funding was allocated to support 47 emergency shelters and transitional housing projects, creating 380 units within First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and Indigenous urban communities across Canada. Great. Okay. So they allocated funding to support these things. Hopefully it made it there. Yeah. They also helped Indigenous communities complete 52 projects that improve community safety and well-being, such as the Red Eagle Lodge in Saskatoon. Okay, great. To address calls to justice 5.5, ensuring access to reliable internet to communities, which is a big thing if you're yeah. have zero access, over 3,000 Indigenous households received high-speed internet access through federally funded projects. Better connectivity means more tools for Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit and gender diverse people in moments of danger, obviously helping them access online resources. But 3,000 doesn't seem like very that does not seem like enough. Like they don't give you the total out of this much. We supported this percentage. It's just yeah. a raw number. Like 3,000 is a lot, but not, and that doesn't cover all of the indigenous households. No, that's that like, exactly like one in a couple reserves. Like, yeah, I don't know. That doesn't seem like no. at all. No. Um, Actually, I heard a stat recently that in Saskatchewan, I believe, indigenous people make up. 11% of our population and one in four, I can't believe I remember these one yeah, but I, I do one in four youth under 25 is indigenous. So yeah, they make up a lot of our young people and our next generations, which is why it's so important right now to like, let's build these bridges, let's build these relationships, let's gain this education um, so that we can support this huge amount of young leaders coming up behind yeah. us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Back to the focus here to uh, address calls for justice around the critical lack of access to health services in communities, which forces indigenous women, girls and two spirit and gender diverse people to relocate to urban areas to access health care without guaranteed safety or security. Mm -hmm. They funded close to 100 indigenous communities and organizations to date to improve midwife free services and infrastructure. OK, 100 communities. I can get on board with that. But pretty good. Yeah. To address systemic issues and root causes of violence, which is the big thing here. Yeah. Over the past year, the ministerial special representative met with 600 people representing more than 125 First Nations, Inuit and Métis government, governments and organizations about the need for a simple, barrier-free, trauma-informed way for Indigenous peoples to address any, any inequities in government programs and services that result in human rights violations. So they met with 600 people from a variety of First Nations and Inuit Métis groups. Um, but they don't really talk about what that means. We met yeah. with them. Did we come to a plan, an action plan, a, a, you know, or did we just talk? The resulting report uh, provides advice on the creation of Indigenous and human rights on business persons, a critical step towards ensuring accountability and justice while helping us implement the calls for justice. So they did suggest the creation of human rights and indigenous human rights on the land i know that like that goes you know government is government mm -hmm. so like it's not it can't be like too heavy-handed or like too in the mix of things but it's like still actually i don't even know that they should be maybe but like i it's still just so baffling to me they're like we met with people and it's like okay and then what mm -hmm. like and that like that's the questions that you and i always ask you're like okay so great you had a conversation now what are you gonna do and they're like well you know we had the conversation and yeah it's just like to get it but like off the box that we did something yeah like that's the whole thing is like so this is just like a checkbox like you put it in your annual report <laughs> now what like and if you look at the commitments, and there are many, which are listed in the uh -huh. 131 calls to justice, I mean, we'll get into the next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spoil <laughs> don't it. spoil it. Don't uh, don't ruin it for everybody yet. <laughs> but anyways, yeah. So that's all, you know, really fantastic and fine and dandy. But we're going to take a look, see at what a media investigation uncovered as shown in CBC's Mother, Sister, Daughter, and MMIWG project. 
tracking Canada's progress and implementing all 231 calls for justice from the final June 2019 report of the National MMIWG inquiry to now. This project served as a report card for the federal and provincial governments across Canada on how far they've come and the overall rating was a failing grade. In summary, the report card showed that after five years since the National Inquiry's calls to justice were launched, only two of the calls to justice are complete. 106 are in progress and more than half, 123, aren't even started. Hmm. How do they even decide, like, what to start, what to wait on, what to do first? Yeah, I mean, I yeah, I don't know. That's a, I mean, that's a really good question. I feel like it's like a the low hanging fruit, yeah, but yes. still. Anyway, CBC identified that on paper it appears there's been lots of action, as at least 45 federal, provincial, and territorial government committees were struck after the inquiry to review the research, rethink the recommendations, and refine the implementation plans. But in reality, it was discovered that many of these committees are just covering the same ground and not actually taking much action. A little shock. Check checking some boxes. The project also points to the fact that while the federal government has committed to more than $2 billion worth of promises in its 2021 budget alone, in reality, much of this promised funding has not been spent. For example, they committed $724 million for a violence prevention strategy for constructing new safe shelters, as Sky mentioned. So far, only a fraction of that has actually been dispersed for shelter projects. Mm. The federal government's 2023 budget also committed $4 billion over seven years for an urban, rural, and northern Indigenous housing strategy. However, that commitment is about $40 billion short oh. of a 2022 report from that assembly of First Nations estimated was needed to address current housing needs. So, like, they actually went... So like mm-hmm. only it sounds big as it's in the billions, of course, but like what not nearly big forty big billion big 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 short. Big not nearly big yeah. big back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, by all means, government move at a glacier pace. Like, yeah. Take your time. Yeah. We really don't have time. Like, no. Or we do not. And I feel like this I I know this is a problem that's getting worse and worse over time. So, no, but like we ought to pick up the pace here. It's so frustrating. It is frustrating. Um, and it just makes me wonder how much actual change will ever take place without those truly impacted, like yes. the families of the, you know, the women and the and the girls that are going, that are gone missing. And, you know, are they involved? And I think back to uh, our episode last May, I think it was, uh, on the story of Happy Charles with her family and... You know, they talked about how they've, you know, rarely seen any funding. There's all this funding being committed, but they nothing really trickles down to the families. Oh, so those impacted. Yeah. yeah. To do anything about it. Like they have to pay out of their pocket to get a billboard or to do any of that stuff. So yeah. it's it just makes you wonder, like, is this just money just sitting there in a pot, like the collecting dust? Or it goes or to like where is it going? To all these committees to be paid? Yeah. Your salary to be on a committee. Yeah. I want it seems like it. So yeah. Uh, it's really that nothing for us without us. And you really just hope that those 231 calls to justice, they were involved in that indigenous people and they have, yeah. you know, they should be spearheading all of it. They should be leading it all. Yeah. So anyway, uh, there's got to be a better way, period. And I'm confident our guest, who will be, I'm very excited for you all to hear more about, will shed some light on this topic and just truth and reconciliation in general. So without further ado, let us welcome Cadmus Delorum. And I will note that we recorded this uh, portion with him about a couple of weeks before this episode aired. So there could be some things he references that may not fully make timing, timing things. Yeah. But yes. Um, so yeah, welcome Cadmus Delorum. We are so happy to have our very special guest Cadmus Delorum with us today. As we had mentioned, uh, we haven't really had a man on the podcast before, uh, so we are very blessed and humbled and happy to have Cadmus with us today. Let me tell you a little bit more about him before we dive into our conversation. So Cadmus Delorme, with GM, is a Cree and Soto leader. He is the former chief of the Cowessus First Nation in Saskatchewan. He holds a Bachelor of Business Administration, a Master of Public Administration, and an ICD 
D designation from the Institute of Corporate Directors. Under his leadership, Calisys focused on economic sustainability through renewable energy, agriculture, and land use initiatives. Cadmus chairs the Residential Schools Document Advisory Committee and serves on various boards, including the University of Regina and Saskatchewan Gaming Corporation. His accolades include the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal and CBC Saskatchewan's Future 40. As chief, he guided Calisys through the discovery of 751 unmarked graves and an historic agreement to regain jurisdiction over children in care. <laughs> wow. Thank wow. you. Honestly, a mouthful. Yes. And very impressive. So as we always do, we would like to start the podcast with some rapid fire questions to like get the juices flowing. So first question is, if you could grant one wish for women, what would it be? Thank you very much for something. Yes, just... I can grant one wish is that women, girls, and, and anyone who identifies within in the, in the category or in that area is to be given all the necessary resources in a rapid fire to get to the full potential rather than just hoping that many get there because when you get to the where every, the equality needs to be we'll see so much change and so my my hope or my my wish is that all resources available need to be there from the beginning right through and not watered down love that i love it not watered down especially oh let's change it it's just the sheer definition of equity versus equality right like we're giving people what they need not just making it equal it's what do women need because we are not an equal playing field so yeah love that next this is always a hard one for people because i'm sure you have a lot of it but the best piece of advice that you've ever received you have one enemy in this world and it's your own thoughts oh yeah (laughs) <laughs> how you in, you tell yourself if you belong in a room to how you talk yourself out of great ideas to how you characterize others by creating something between your own thought so your greatest enemy is between your own ears mm-hmm. oh yeah absolutely that definitely hits hard what is your scary? I mean, that last one was a little bit scary. But <laughs> what is your scary? My scary is is everybody has a battle that they don't tell us about. Ooh. And my scary is is that we ignore others' battles, and society is not going to succeed because. We don't give that space for people to win their own battle. So my scary is that I could raise my kids the best I can, but the world my kids have to live in has to be somewhat in the similar pattern. Yeah, very much so. Well, and even just equipping people with the ability, emotional capacity to share their battles, right? And speak their battles speak, and people to ask question and, you know, and it'll be safe to do so yeah, exactly yeah. have the psychologically safe spaces yeah definitely so we've already kind of gotten a little bit deep <laughs> but <laughs> never is rapid fire quick and easy yeah sort of thing. never yeah but uh today talking about truth and reconciliation and missing and murdered indigenous women girls and two-spirit folks um this top this topic is very heavy mm-hmm. and a lot of nuance and uh and a lot of a variety of experiences go into it. Um, So why are you so passionate about this topic? Very good. I was raised at a kitchen table where both my parents are residential school living witnesses. I never attended. I was um, born at a kitchen table where we were love rich. We weren't money rich. And my parents did everything they could to make me feel like a champion and to be successful and a dreamer in this country. And my mother, you know, has been through a lot. Uh, I didn't know this till I got older. Um, she never talked about it, but you know, when we got older, when I got older, start to understand the patterns in my own immediate family. You know, my own intergenerational trauma and 
know why certain topics bring us to a real ugly um, conversation and very, um, you know, not the most healthiest talk about other people. And so when I start to realize, um, I start to find out what my mother, you know, went through in her younger years and, you know, her experience in residential school and the abuse was real to, you know, trying to raise my older siblings before she met my dad and, you know, and trying to come to balance with the enemy between her ears because of what she just couldn't overcome at the time. And then she had me and, you know, decided I'm going to be, you know, someone that'll never come home to, you know, any kind of substance or, uh, you know, to live in an environment where education is priority. And, uh, and so when I started to really understand that, um, um, my mom changed from like my mom to like my motivation and like, I can't like believe you, you're like, you did all this and then still like remain grounded. And so, you know, today I look at, you know, just I'm a male and I'm you know, a very proud male, but when I look at females, I say I could not have been this positive and this person without my mom foundationally teaching me this. I had moments in my life where I was humbled. Um, I remember being in a hockey dressing room one time when I was 16 in a male hockey dressing room and I'm born in 82. So this was around 1996. And some male buddy of mine said this joke about a female body part. And I laughed like everybody else did. Mm -hmm. And his dad stood up and he said, your moms are women. You shouldn't be laughing at that. And I sat down and I'm like, why did I find that so funny? And I start to think my whole life growing up on the reserve, growing up around men that I grew up with, that was a common joke. Mm. Like that's just normal joking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to not get too detailed and not in this question alone, but I start to realize there's two humors that I grew up with. One of them was helium humor, which is the humor we should all have. The other one, the weighted humor. And that joke was weighted humor. And I grew up with a lot of weighted humor. And a lot of it was towards females, especially in a male environment. Like, right. And it was becoming normal to me. And so, you know, another instant was, you um, know, my mom and dad had challenges. Like every relationship probably does. And I remember sitting with my mom one time and she was just crying. And I was like 18. And she's like, my son, don't you ever hurt a woman because look at what your mom's going through. And I remember looking at my mom and I'm like, my, my dad, but not the loyalist. He didn't take my mom or he wasn't the loyalist at one moment. And um, I remember looking at my mom and I'm like, my gosh, the most perfect person I think in this world is just crying right now. And I told my mom, mom, I will never hurt a female. Like I promise you, I will never. And, you know, all my relationships before I met my wife, you know, I never, you know, never hurt. I never tried to, then my wife and I've been married for 12 years, but together 17 and 18 years. And you know, I've never, you know, that really set the tone for me. Like my mom sitting there. So you know, to sum it up, females played the biggest part in my life. Um, even in high school, my best friends were girls, women, like young women, I, you girls, I guess teenagers and, uh, I just couldn't handle the men's ego. And you know, if a man, I'm like, I couldn't handle like It wasn't fun to act tough and to be cool. I'd rather just be silly and laugh. And so, you know, my best friends in high school were females. And, you know, I always just, um, just as I always honored, honored myself as a male, just understood that females just see this life differently. And I feel I've been close enough to, almost see it at times and today I just respect that mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> we did an episode last season with Lori Campbell talking about matriarchy specifically in indigenous culture um and just like that shift of looking at women as uplifters and as like grounders and like community builders versus <laughs> servants or you know like whatever else yeah <laughs> the just the child bearers um, so just hearing you speak about that is very 
it's reminiscent of our conversation with Lori. All the aunties and the mom. Yeah, the huge role that they play. Huge. Yeah, and the respect, right? Like, yeah, the different level of respect I think we see in other cultures. Definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So, um, so on the same vein, what does truth and reconciliation mean to you? Mm-hmm. I'm a very proud indigenous person. I actually got to tone it down at times. I got all the teeth. I yeah. just, I just uh, you know, I, I carry it in my tone and, you know, the way I carry myself and my humor and, you know, my message. Yeah, I'm going to go back to my parents just, just to get you to understand, get everybody to understand truth and reconciliation. TRC is our, to get it back to where it should have been always. That's what truth and reconciliation is. As, as a society, we inherited it history together. Nobody today created what we all know are now residential schools in the next 60 school, but we all inherit in this history. So as Canadians, we inherit something. You have a responsibility to do something about it. What is the TRC and why am I so passionate about it? When residential school survivors rightfully needed to get and have their financial compensation in 2012 because of a federal loss in a court case and the federal government had to give a financial compensation today we kind of you know learn a little bit about that every residential school survivor got a financial compensation but in order to get that financial compensation a residential school survivor two of them being my parent had to sit in front of a government panel of people and they were asked four questions what was life before residential school what was life after residential school what was life during residential school and what is one thing you tell a Canadian to make sure this never happens again? You know, my parents buried those stories for decades. And in order to get us financial compensation, they had to bring those old stories up. And they were terrible stories of what they experienced. And because of that, every one of us now have 94 calls to action. So every residential school survivor we shop beside, that we live beside, that their grandkids go to school with our kids and grandkids. Mm-hmm. It's now our responsibility to implement those 94 calls to action because the authors, they're the ones that we can't go back and say sorry, but we can show their kids and grandkids that we're going to get it right this time. And so, you know, history is very emotional. Corners us as Canadians, we feel guilty, we feel bad, you know, we feel ashamed. Indigenous people don't want pity or anybody to feel sorry for us. We want parity. We want our kids to succeed in Canada while their Indigenous worldview isn't tested anymore. Mm-hmm. And the TRC is going to get it. And so I am a walking example of what TRC is going to do for all of us. I'm a very proud Indigenous person. I take that with very good stride. But I'm also an extremely proud Canadian. Mm-hmm. I know the benefit of what this country can give if you utilize everything in the right way. And so... We need to do more with TRC, and that's why I'm so passionate about it. Let's explain. So, uh, I mean, we, I, we know about the call to action, and we've talked about the call to action, but hearing the the personal side and the personal story to it, and that it's not, it wasn't just, you know, someone high up in government saying, oh, I think that you should do these 94 things. It was the people who experienced it, and it was the people who went through the trauma and re- had to reopen the trauma to then make a difference and really tell that truth part of it but yep it's a point piece and clear like i feel like you know you hear a lot about truth and reconciliation and national day or truth and reconciliation and these 94 day uh, acts uh calls to action but it's like what did they really mean where did they come from who made them and what's the but it's the whole nothing without us or nothing for us without us right and they are the ones who built those and that's why we need to yeah take action and, and build and change so Love that. Yeah. So from your perspective, then, um, the 94 calls to action have been implemented or have been called for, I guess is the right word. Why has the implementation been so slow and so few? Yeah. I'll explain it to you through the timeline. Yeah. So 2003, Canada lost a court case. Because of that court case brought forward by residential school survivors for the policies of Canada and how they were treated because of those policies, Canada lost the court case. So in 2008, our then Prime Minister Stephen Harper stood up in our House of Commons and apologized for the role Canada played on behalf of Canadians. He didn't do that because he was morally and ethically responsible. He did that because he was legally obligated because of the loss of the court case. 
Then the common experience payments come out in 2012. Canada didn't do that for residential school survivors because Canada was morally and ethically responsible. They did that because it was legally obligated. Mm -hmm. So because of that, in 2015, we have the Truth and Reconciliation Calls to Action. This is where it flipped. There's no legal obligation to implement the Truth and Reconciliation. It's morally and ethically responsibility for every one of us now. Mm -hmm. And so we're into this for nine years. We're the first generation to really walk reconciliation. Mm -hmm. But the reason we have challenges and the reason that, you know, we're doing great at the same time is think of it like a math equation. The denominator is truth. The numerator is reconciliation. So we can add all the different numbers on the numerator. But if we don't understand and acknowledge the truth, we're not going to get far in reconciliation. Nope. And every Canadian's brain was wired differently to understand truth. Our education system had a missed opportunity to, to validate truth for us. And so moving forward, think of New Zealand, another Commonwealth country in our Commonwealth. They stopped fighting the Maori in the 1970s and just realized that they have two worldviews, a Maori worldview and a New Zealand worldview. They've been doing this for 70 years. Today, when you study the, Ma the New Zealand, they have to challenge it, but they're the strongest economic country amongst our Commonwealth. You look at their education system, it's, just up as, it's as if it's normal. That Maori worldview mm -hmm. is respected and New Zealand worldview. You look at their sports. You see their sports before they play. They have this intimidation that called the haka. Mm -hmm. yeah. Half of that team is non is non Maori. You see it in the eyes of those New Zealand non Indigenous people how much they believe in that haka, because they've been doing it for seventy years in Canada. We've been doing it for nine years. Like we are nurturing a nine-year-old baby called Truth and Reconciliation. Of course, we're going to get it wrong. Of course, we're going to make little mistakes. Of course, many are going to rather do nothing than make a mistake and do something. Mm -hmm. Of course, some are going to get frustrated because we're not moving quick enough. But the thing is, is we got to make it norm. Mm -hmm. And so that is why, you know, Truth and Reconciliation is so difficult at times, but it's so beneficial and it's going to become normal. But we're in the first generation to really lead this. Totally. Yeah. Even we have educators in our family, in both of our families. Um, and even just hearing what's being taught in elementary schools, I mean, even just from kids, but being taught in elementary schools and in high schools, that is never anything that was talked about when we went to hell. Not ever. So and now we're yeah. parents of young kids, right? You will be learning this, which is amazing. But it also like, they know more than we do. Yeah, we're learning alongside them. Like we, you know, which is a good thing. So we're having to do our own research and our own education, which is needed to help walk our children through this truth and help them make sense of it and understand it. But as parents, really being that generation, it's nine years, right, of being the parents of these kids who are going through it. It's very interesting. Oh, yeah. And extremely important. So, no. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a whole, like like you said, it's, I mean, it's a worldview and it's it's a whole shift that we all have to buy into and want to do versus that legality of it. I mean, there's a lot of things I'm sure legally that we don't want to do, but we have to do, you know, paying taxes. <laughs> it's just, it's not fun, but we have to do it. Um, but this is just so morally imperative to for our whole nation to move forward and to, again, make things right. That's right. So within the 94 calls to action, there are a couple around specifically to focusing on women and missing marine indigenous women. Um, so can you tell us about those and if you've seen any movement or noticed any changes in those areas? Thank you, right. You know, the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls calls to justice to 231, you know, just another action in our country. Um, that's very important, you know, needs to have its emphasis and its respect that it, it's TR, TRC is important. Like everybody in this country, people will say 94 calls to action. People will say truce and reconciliation. We just got to remember, we have another 231 calls to justice. And those are the missing and murdering just women. Who is the author of those? Again, very similar. It was the families that have a missing or murdered that 
you know, drove and where the authors of the two and that's one. But then, you know, bringing in the truth and reconciliation. Yep. At one time in, in on this land we all live on, you know, there was something called a woman's council. I'm talking centuries ago. Mm -hmm. The woman council made the final decision. And so the hereditary chief in Edmund in the governance tribal system, mm -hmm. um, the hereditary chief in Edmund were the spokespeople and the ones that went in spoke on behalf and the ones that just kind of, you know, led the message. The final decision came from the woman council, you know, and so there are very powerful ceremonies about it. There was a, you know, very strict. And then you had, you know, coming of age and you had to earn those and, you know, there was certain education. You had to go through uh, your grade 12, your undergraduate, your master's and PhD to get on the woman council. Like, I mean, you know, just saying it's indigenous always had, you know, over the decades and centuries, um, you know, and just the way, you know, when indigenous start interacting with European, but like, you no, know, we talk to the men, we don't talk to the women and it starts throwing off the governance structure. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when, you know, even that treaty time with treaty four right here, you know, Alexander Morris spoke with the chiefs and that's why today our reserves are named after men. Like houses was a male right. chief. Pie pot was a male chief. You don't have reserves that are named after a female leader. We have amazing, strong female leader. Mm -hmm. And I'm just telling you the patterns of how it shifted to today, why there's so much emphasis. You know, the toughest person to be in our country is an Indigenous female. Yeah. And, you know, I'm raising an eight-year-old Indigenous female right now. And my mom told me stories that, you know, I, makes me just you know, cringe. But at the same time, I have to stay a dreamer that we're going to get better. And so to, to really emphasize now the numbers or just the missing and murdered 231 um, you know, we have to make those a very strong conversation and they're going to be the most uncomfortable conversation, especially with men in the room. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I can sit in a whole room of men, then, you know, we can start to have that conversation now, but it has its limits. And, you know, if females are not in the room, you know, who's advocating to make that normal? Or when there's females in the room, who's advocating you know, to just understand that after no indigenous in the room, who's advocating. And so I, I just want to, you know, check myself at the door here in a very respectful way is that I'm a male. I, you know, understand all this. I, I feel I can, you know, sense it and feel it. When I was a chief, um, you get a lot of, um, calls and situations and, um, a bit the re sad reality is, you know, more than half of the poverty calls were women in distress, mothers in distress. And it's like, why did like four to one in calls that it's always that women are in this country? And when I was chiefing, you have to somehow manage that, you know, that, that the situation. And so, no, I don't feel we're getting better. If I can be real, I think we're actually still going to get a little worse than, than what's coming as Canadians and Indigenous people. And just saying that, that means we're not taking the TRC or the calls to justice mm -hmm. as serious as we need to. Yeah. There's a couple of things that popped into my mind as you were talking about. One is that um, the you, you spoke at the beginning about like you, you know we have to all understand and accept the truth and, to, and the fact that you know this happened in our country and all of that sort of thing. Um, but just as women, regardless of your indigeneity or non-indigeneity uh it is hard to sit at tables sometimes with men and and say like this is the real experience and this is what we're experiencing and so oftentimes I, I feel like i have to say oh sorry that you feel like you're being attacked right now but this is a real experience but i mean that's never happened on the flip side of you know women being torn down in locker rooms and that sort of thing as you had talked about um and so it's 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 still like that path alone of just that equity piece of seeing women as equal and equitable in society and and treating women with respect is uh, is still its own challenge. But then you add on top of it, we've done many podcasts on um, the, like our very very first one was on uh, intimate partner violence and the stats for Indigenous women are skyrocketing 
And we just did one on back to school and violence against young girls and the stats for young indigenous women are, are much higher than everyone else. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, it, there's still so much work to do. And that the fact that this, these are called calls justice versus just even calls to action, like there's justice to be done and there's, there's a lot of wrongs to be righted for sure. Well, and even just the fact that there's 231 yeah. of them. Like there's 94 calls to action, but 231 calls to justice. Wow. Yeah. Like there is tons of work to be done. And when you think about like these are moral things that we need to do and ethical things, there are so many that were legal things like murder and yeah. violence. And like to me, those are legal. Like let's get on. Yeah. This has to be done. Like it's not a should, it's a has to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, just some, some to make sure we understand in the audience and what we're talking about, there are some really good growth happening that's right now, you know, mm -hmm. like females to males going back to university and like they, teening degrees is like so much more. Yeah, we're moving. The and then, you know, education really opens the mind, mm -hmm. really expands, you know, the strategic understanding. Um, when I was a politician, um, men outnumbered women at least six to one in First Nations politics when I was in there. And, you know, I was like, geez, I'd like even around my own council chambers, you know, I always had for every, you know, at least one female, I had at least four men around the table. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, politics is very emotional. It's, it's very, um, you know, it's very cutthroat. It's, it's very, you got to make tough decisions. And, um, I, I would even see the difference in how decisions were made Yeah, as a chief sitting there because I wasn't a decision maker. I, I had to, you know, give the eight counselors in my governance structure all the information to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And I could even, you know, by the end, pre-predict which way things were going to sway based on even just the male to female decisions. And that's not just the education, but it's, you know, the fact and the walk of life, yeah. you know, and sometimes, you know, just... um the sternness, you know, you get the different generations too. Yeah. Like you get an older generation that, you know, just suck it up and, you know, <laughs> just, just, you know, it's a long ways from the heart kind of attitude. And, you know, you get a different generation. It's, you know, not what you said, it's how you said it. And yeah. so, you know, and, and then you bring that all into both, you know, a male and female perspective around the table. Um, um, I would rather have more women around the table than men in many decisions, you know, not, not trying to say men can't make good decisions. Cause I know a lot of smart men that make really good decisions, but there were times I'm like, ah, if we had more women around the table, this, this wouldn't have to go this far into this political decision. Right. We would be making these strong decisions for the best interest already. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's even interesting just as a ex-politician, mm -hmm. how even that spilled in just because of, you know, the difference. So I just wanted to highlight there is some oh, yeah. really, uh, oh, with yeah. pins out here. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I know we're not saying that, yeah. but, you know, it, it, it just balances that, you know, we're on the horizon. Yeah. Yeah. There are many areas that we are doing great in, like yeah. so many, but not enough. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the thing, right? Not enough. Yeah. It's not quite equitable yet. But uh, yeah, once those tables get more diverse and diverse perspectives and that sort of thing, I think decisions will be made faster. Yes. <laughs> so... You kind of touched on a few of them, but again, from your perspective, why is the implementation of the calls to justice been so slow and so few with 231? So a lot more. I, you know, people want to help in all areas. We have so much in this country right now it's going on. You know, um, I think reconciliation was given more emphasis after the unmarked graves. Mm -hmm. I think the unmarked grave validation in 2021 really allowed Canada to wake up and say, listen, maybe what I thought I knew, I didn't know. Yeah. Like, how can there be a grave site beside a elementary school or a high school in our country? And, you know, and so it really emphasized the uh, TRC, mm -hmm. but it didn't emphasize the calls to justice. What happened in Manitoba at the, at the landfill in Winnipeg yeah. and how it got so political in the last provincial election showed Manitoba that this is not right, how we can utilize such a bad situation and make it political. And um, 
from watching Manitoba to see if that now emphasizes more the importance of the 231 calls to justice. Because fortunately, it takes a tragedy something for us to realize how important it is. And um, I just don't feel the 231 calls to justice gets the emphasis that it's needed. Right. Um, every Indigenous family in our country has a cousin or an immediate that is a part of the 231. It, it's, it, it's really heavy on us. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, we have our own internal challenges as Indigenous to Indigenous. You know, we, we have been through so much in the last decades and generations. Right? We've kind of become our own worst enemy to each other at times. <laughs> You know, and that comes in just, you know, the hurt and the pain of just trying to succeed and trying to overcome, you know, the, in 2012, when the common experience payments came out, every residential school survivor in this country had to dig out those stories and they got money for it, yeah. but there was no follow-up with mental emotional. Mm -hmm. So every Indigenous family was negatively impacted. After that money was gone, many sat there on their couch and said, I can't believe that happened to me. Like, I don't, I, I'm, I'm so pissed off now. And yeah. so that kind and then the, um, one of our graves was triggering to us, you know, now the pretend Indian is triggering. So, you know, why is the missing and murdered 231 calls to justice, you know, not, you know, really, you know, making progress. Canada, I don't think see the emphasis of it because a lot don't feel the emotion of it as indigenous we feel the emotion of it but it's almost become normal which is really sad yeah um and so you know it, it's really tough it's just a tough situation where you have to i find trc's driven for economy it's driven for you know and the 231 can be very similar the more successful Indigenous females we have in our country, the more our social and economic impact will all benefit all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. And in this country, that's kind of how you have to market things sometimes to, to, to really get industry on board, political on board, citizens on board. So um, I think we just have to revamp it in the marketing I hate to say it in the marketing way I'm just trying to get the message out there and it means that we have to you know find out how it I'll, I'll leave it at this I feel I have to spend a lot of time as a very proud TRC advocate to explain to people why they have to do it <laughs> and I take that seriously I'll go across this country explaining to Canadians why they have to do it and I'm like sometimes I'm like closing my eyes at the end of the day, I'm like, why do I have to spend so much time explaining why? Shouldn't we be like, how can we do it? Yeah. yeah. And that's where I feel that 231 calls to justice are. Yeah. I feel like we have to explain why we have to do it and we shouldn't have to do that. And so it's a situation update. I don't have the solution. Maybe I said it and I didn't even realize I said it, but, um, you know, we have some work to do. The a really interesting perspective of marketing something to folks that it means sometimes you have to speak their language in order for them to understand it and in living in such a capitalist world and country and system and all of that oftentimes folks are i mean you kind of have to look up for number one and so then it's like well what well, what's in it for me why do i care why should i care and the why obviously is very very important but yeah we need me should understand now why so then it gets to the how and what can we do about it and what can i do about it? because i think that a lot of times non-indigenous folks are also like i don't know if it's my space or i don't know what i should do or how am i going to step over the line or i don't want to offend anybody so understanding that and doing the work ourselves to figure out how we can be best supporting mm -hmm. indigenous communities through the calls to action but also through the calls to justice yeah so as a um, very well-known and articulate um, you. TRC advocate, like you said, in our community, well-known leader and champion of that, what are you doing and how much time do you spend talking specifically about those 231 calls to justice? 
I um, started a company called One Group uh, Advisory Services, and one of my, you know, one of our pillars is professional development. Number fifty-seven of TRC, professional development. So I take it very seriously, and I bring a very strong message, uh, keynote message across the country. Um, in my message, I'm constantly emphasizing, you know, the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls called to justice as a foundation for us to get to that parity. And uh, so it, it is normal to just for me to talk about. Um, I do get direction and, and I get, you know, um, advice from, you know, the, the real leaders of this, you know, the Indigenous females and uh, many different roles from grandmothers to moms to, to young, younger girls, even my daughter. You know, my daughter is uh, a dreamer right now at eight years old. And, you know, I'm going to make sure I could protect her to be a dreamer. But at the same time, you know, I realize I have to try twice as hard to make her successful in this country. And so I'm, I'm very stern with my God. You know, that's sad at times, but I'm doing it because I want her to succeed and realize she's going to have to try twice as hard. And, you know, so I, I feel like I'm also raising someone in this country that is going to show this country that we can win by knowing the 231 calls to justice. And, you know, so I, I, I try and walk it as well. You know, I, um, I, I'm going to be real and open with you. I, there's decisions I had to make as a chief where you know, someone could probably criti criticize me and say I was actually against it. You know, I just, you know, sometimes you just have some real tough decisions to make and mm -hmm. sometimes you get voted against and you just have to stand up and speak as if it was your decision. And um, I know there's probably people listening or politicians out there that probably were put in situations similar. And so we, we just can't, you know, only hold a negative back of what we're not doing. You no, know, we have to continue to just remold it and get it stronger. So I, I try to make it a part of my every day. And then I try and exercise it and live it as, as if it's normal that we just have to implement the 231. Should be I mean, it really should be a part of our everyday life, mm -hmm. just as normal. And as you see more and more organizations, you know, a part of their strategic plan is truth and reconciliation. And what are they going to do to, you know, implement that within their business and in the community? But you never really see much around the 231 calls to justice. And so I'm open, I'm waiting for the day because that goes hand in hand with just other things like gender yeah. equality and all those other pieces. But I don't think people are quite making the connection between the two uh, yet. So yeah, it's a whole dream. So shifting gears a little bit, uh, both the calls to action and the calls to justice reports address to some extent the role of media and bloggers and social media influencers in raising awareness and decolonizing and educating the public. Well, we do a lot of work ourselves and we do a lot of research and we do the best that we can. From your perspective, as kind of an expert in this area and really living it um, and raising a young daughter, part of the raise her, <laughs> our, our mission, what direction, if any, can you give us uh, at Raise Her to create action related to the call to action and call to justice? Nice. Like, words of advice. We can create a picture of what we think it is by the patterns we've learned by what we see on TV, by what we read in a book. But say Regina, for example. And we do we actually just go to an event and go and actually just see it ourselves with our own eyes? You know, you go to a, I'm just going to give it, we're, we're going to have September 30th come up in a couple of weeks here. You know, there's going to be dancers there. There's going to be young kids dressed up in regalia. There's going to be grandmothers dressed up in regalia. Um, there's going to be an uh, entrepreneur selling beadwork. There's going to be, uh, you know, you know, to just talk with them for five minutes and to just like, you know, to find something in that conversation that just motivates you to say, I never would have ever heard or thought of that. You know, sometimes we just, we take too much from just, being in the audience and to just to just really get right into there and just go and actually, you know, talk to, to someone or to, 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 to live it for a couple minutes to, to embrace it. You know, on, on, you know, 
But what I do, and I'm just sharing this with you, I'm not bragging or anything. I love going to correctional centers and I talk to inmates. Yeah. I don't ever ask them why they're in there. I just tell them a story about such a funny story about Indigenous people and they laugh so hard and then they want to know another one. Yeah. And then they want to know another one. But then at the same time, like just seeing them, you know, in that moment and the way they look at me, like, I don't see a criminal. I see a human being that was probably wrong. Maybe just something happened to put them in that moment to make that terrible decision to why they're in there. Free. And, you know, and I use that as an example as, you know, how do we, you know, learn more about the 231 calls to justice or the, two, the 94 call to action is, um, don't be in the grandstand. Just go down and talk and you know, really emphasize it. If your daughter or son has a, an Indigenous, you know, equivalent, then tell them to invite them over to the house and, you know, let them have supper. If you're going to be laughing at the story, they're probably going to tell you because some of our kids are too honest and something. <laughs> if you're not used to what, you know, like, I always tell my daughter, don't you be telling your friend about that. <laughs> And then, you know, sometimes the teacher will say, you know what your son said? I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so, you know, I I'm, I hope you get my message here. Is, you know, we can create an understanding and advocacy from the grandstands, but the way we really live it is know your own community. Yeah. Know who your biggest ad. Like, I'll give you an example. With Regina, like Shana Passa. I'm just doing a one name here. Great friend of mine, amazing mother. Huge advocate. Uh, she does beadwork. She does culture. You know, she she's one. Go have coffee with her. It's one day to message her and say, let's go for coffee. It'd be amazing at what she's going to tell you. And, you know, it's going to be like, yeah. never thought of her like that. So hopefully you get my message within yeah. the message here. Yeah. Don't don't necessarily be a bystander. You can yeah, be get right in there. Yeah. 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 Get your hand scared. Tell her what I do. So... I'm kind of moving forward as a dreamer and a hoper and a, you know, influencer of the future. What changes relating to Tooth and Reconciliation um, do you hope the election uh, that we have happening and, and the, the federal one coming next year um, will bring in our, to our community? Yeah. I am um, nonpartisan. I just got to start off with that. We are too. We are okay. too. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. I, do have, I do have my opinions. And you're <laughs> probably going to hear a little bit of bias in my opinions here. I don't, you know, in our province of Saskatchewan, I'm, we're bound to have an election in October. Um, no, I, we're we're going to have a SAS party. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be real here. I'm not going to try and emphasize anything that I, I'm not an NDP or a SAS party. I'm just, you know, I want everybody to win and succeed in our province. But, I don't think we're going to have enough sway to, to have, you know, different party. Hope I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but saying that, I'm just saying that to lead up to why I'm talking, is um, when I was chief, I would tell Premier Mo, have a meeting in this province where the cabinet sits with the chiefs for one day. The whole province will know and they'll be watching. I'm like, yes, you're going to have a very, very tough meeting. But over the years, when you meet once a day, every business, every municipality, every community is going to say, our cabinet and our chiefs in this province are sitting down and working together. You don't get that today. Mm -hmm. How can we live and talk in this province as if we're going to work together? Yeah. When the tone at the top doesn't even sit down yeah. and work together. And so, you know, I'm not criticizing the SAS party. I know it's tough. There's really only one province that does that in this whole country, and that's British Columbia. Mm -hmm. They do a two-day retreat. I don't, I don't, I don't mean the retreat as in like a vacation, but a two-day where the cabinet of BC government go with the chiefs for two days, and they just talk about everything. They don't agree to it, mm -hmm. and at least they understand where each other sit. I'm sure with Premier Wap Canoe, they do that a little bit better now, but I'm just telling you, in Saskatchewan, that's the politics I hope we transition to. We have to understand that Section 92 is what this province protects. 
the Constitution, Section 92. Their duty of care is to protect Section 92. And that's why you get all these legal Constitution things with the federal government. And uh, you know what the federal government? You know, I kind of feel we're going to switch. I know it's inevitable. We do every 10 years. We yeah. have since Confederation. And you know, we're going to switch back to a conservative. You know, I don't know if it's going to be the majority, but we're going to have somewhat. And, you know, Stephen Harper put a really tough taste in First Nations and felt conservatives treated First Nations. Mm -hmm. You know, I uh, know people who know Polyev and know, um, you know, what, what, you know, he's trying to do and what uh, conservatives are trying to do. But I tell you, it's going to be starting with very minimal trust. You know, Justin Trudeau and the Liberals um, did what they could with what they had. That the Jody Wilson Rabel um, was a rock in their shoe and how they treated and how, you know, she quit because she didn't feel that she was respected. Mm -hmm. A female cabinet minister in our country. And, you know, and I read both her books and, you know, maybe in the cupboard was very direct at what happened and True Reconciliation, I do recommend. It's a great book. And so, you know, I, I do think politics uh, need to uh, adjust accordingly, uh, but politicians have one goal, to get reelected. In order to get reelected, you got to support to your base. You know, if I ever get back into politics, I think I want to get into non-indigenous politics, but my toughest decision is I'll have to pick a party. And, you know, I I can critique and give positives of every party that, that does things. And so, but at the end of the day, you know, I feel, you know, we just have to understand as citizens, we watch. And the actions is how we react. And so if there's more better positive with that tone at the, at the tables and respect, it's going to change us in our attitude as well to motivate us yeah. to do better. Yeah. We got to walk the talk. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, know, yeah. you watch the, what's it called? The Adamate? No, the Adam. Well, the debate <laughs> as a whole. <laughs> <laughs> the, what, why? Well, I have no brain cells. Um, The, when they're like in the house and they're talking. Can oh, I, yeah. The, you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> on CTAC. Yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, the, yes. That when they're in question period. Yeah, question yeah. period. Thanks, <laughs> you don't know where that went but like they don't respect each other at all there's no respect they call each other names they hoot and holler over each other and like if that was my child doing that they would be getting a talking to about what respect looks like and how to treat each other and so then when it does come from the top down and like kind of in that way i mean there's i don't think that's a true hierarchy but it, it does definitely seem as though there's the hierarchy in that way um that's yeah how are you going to think that everyone else is going to treat each other and I think that um, cabinets, you should absolutely go into power. I was going to in my next thing. I was like, you have my vote. Please. <laughs> is, is it too late to yeah. run for mayor? Or yeah. Mayor? Or I don't think so. Yeah, I'm just... You have my vote for sure. Yeah, yeah thank me you. too. Do you have any other advice for the community, people listening? What would you leave us with? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. Yeah, we, we're doing good things. You know, I feel the biggest challenge is sometimes we'll do nothing rather than something for the simple fact we don't want to make a mistake. We don't want to disrespect. We don't want to, uh, you know, go back. We want to go forward. And so um, we just have to understand that, you know, the kitchen table is the most important table to talk this conversation. And, you know, to just always spend some time and talking with our kids, saying, you know, what did you learn? today and you know what what is truth and reconciliation if they say we talked about reconciliation they really use that moment and mm -hmm. you don't just say well what what do you what do you learn and we we'll just understand that's where the kitchen table starts you know and then lastly you no know, indigenous people you know we love living in canada today we we have our challenges we have our mistrust mm -hmm. But we love living in Canada. The challenge that, you know, is so uncomfortable is our Indigenous worldview still isn't respected. Because we all live in two worldviews in this country, mm -hmm. an Indigenous worldview and a Canadian worldview. My daughter, Kelly, you know, will have the same Indigenous worldview as her great-great-grandma and my mom as well, and my grandma and great-grandma. 
But Tally is also going to be a pilot or a nurse or a tradesperson. Callie's going to have the best of both worlds. And so, you know, I just leave it that. Just remember, indigenous people, we love living in Canada. We love, you know, what the many positives. There's a lot of negatives. I'm not trying to say that it's all positive. But the challenge is, is um, the more we as Canadians, the non-indigenous, welcome in the indigenous worldview into our lives as if it's normal, even if you don't have an Indigenous person at your kitchen table, make it normal that we live in an Indigenous worldview too. The more that Indigenous are going to help us as Canadians bring back what a true Canadian is. Because this country is in this moment because, and this world is transitioning because, you know, we just, too much negative on internet did you know a child sees 12,000 people die by the time they're 12 years old? Ugh. Through video games, through sure will be, we might die. Through, and it's become subconscious in their brain. You know, today when you drive in Regina or it's Saskatchewan, you see all these F.U. Trudeau. Shows. Shows. I'm teaching my kids, you treat people how you want to be treated. Well, what am I going to tell them? Accept that sticker, that person is an exception. I mean, we're shifting in Canada. Because of the polarization happening to the South as well, it's becoming, like, I'm very cautious of what our next generation is going to be like. And so, you know, in, the more we welcome an Indigenous worldview into our lives as Canadians, the more I feel we're going to transition back to what that real Canadian is to us. <laughs> and Indigenous people need to be at that table and a part of the growth. In, in all levels. And so I'm starting to ramble on and my finally could tell I'm an ex-politician. But, <laughs> you know, I, I just, you know, I just want Canadians to know, make it normal, make it stern, don't water it down. If you feel you're making a mistake, you might be, but just go and ask mm -hmm. and correct it on the spot and just keep moving forward mm -hmm. and don't shelf it because our kids are going to thank us one day. Like, Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Honestly, it's the things that I've learned in this, what, hour uh, are like, yeah, honestly, like you've taken everything that we've been talking about and just made it so much clearer and simpler. And I hope that everyone listening has some really, uh, some clarity as well and some key kind of action steps and takeaways. Because I know I do. So yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you both. This is an honor. Wow, it's always such a pleasure. And if you've had the pleasure to ever speak with Cadmus like in person, he's just such a I don't know, peaceful, hopeful, optimistic, just like kind, like the kindness just radiates from him. Um, he's just an amazing individual and he gives us so much, especially non-indigenous people, so much willful education and yeah. grace and patience as we walk this reconciliation journey and build our knowledge and our set on our settler history and the damage done by Fran and sisters. He shared some really great advice on what truth of reconciliation is truly about and what we can do today as allies and settler people to acknowledge this history, build strong, trusting relationships with indigenous people and ensure that this past never repeats ourself. So one thing I believe he mentioned, um, and I've heard from many other Indigenous kind of leaders in our community, is um, an amazing individual that they recommend listening to, hearing about, reading books mm -hmm. from, and that is Jody Wilson-Raybould. So in 2015, Jody Wilson-Raybould became Canada's first Indigenous Minister of Justice and Attorney General under the current government, under Justin uh, Trudeau, uh, where... She played a significant role in advancing justice, reforms, and Indigenous rights. Later in 2019, she resigned. So only a couple of years later, she resigned from the Liberal cabinet over the SNC Lavalin affair, where she faced political pressure in case in a case involving the engineering firm. Her principled stance on the rule of law integrity earned her widespread respect mm -hmm. overall as a result of that. Yep. So she's not only an impactful change maker in her role in government, but she's also an ad vocal advocate for Indigenous rights and reconciliation in Canada. And she wrote the book, True Reconciliation, How to Be a Force for Change. And this book is highly recommended. Uh, it outlines the steps we need to achieve meaningful recognition between Indigenous people and Canada. 
I mean, we often hear this term reconciliation, but I feel like it's such a huge word. It's been, what does it mean? How? What do I do? And people are scared to get it wrong and do the wrong thing and create more trauma or more right. divide. So she gives just simple recommendations. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to share some of those with you here. Yeah. So we're going to go through some of the key actions that she suggests. And hopefully this will just make it a little bit easier to comprehend and some key things that you can do uh, specifically on National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, but um, also just moving forward. So first, educate yourself. Learn about Indigenous history, the legacy of colonization, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action, and the 231 missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls calls for justice. And choose at least one from each to focus your action on with your organization, your community, or even your family, or just individually. One thing I just want to note in you, yeah. I, I don't admit, I just did um, a couple days before Truth and Reconciliation, Day for Truth and Reconciliation, I attended a blanket exercise oh okay this is a super powerful way for you to gain like a whole history lesson like really the whole story and the trauma and the key points i know there are many and what do you say is key or not but really getting an understanding and you're interactive you're involved um I, i've i've never done anything so deeply impactful in a, it's a learning. You learn by doing. So you all stand on blankets and you are the Indigenous people. And then there's a narrator that reads out all the stats throughout time um, that the settlers impose on Indigenous people. And at the end of it, you realize there's like no blankets left. There's no Turtle Island left. There's no land for these Indigenous people because the blankets get stripped away depending on what's happening in an exercise. Yeah. And it is just a very powerful way um, to learn and feel what this what this was like and not even close to a fraction of yeah it was a reality but just really feel it so highly recommend a uh, blanket exercise if you can get your your organization signed up for it i did it with Dodie ferguson if you google her she's from saskatchewan but she's amazing and i know she's probably got other um, people do it as well but just highly recommend yeah great thank you yeah. for that recommendation i've um i've never actually been fortunate to attend a blanket ceremony but i've heard of them and i've seen people talk about them and i've heard people talk about like the impacts that they had and i've heard it's very powerful yeah so yes definitely do that uh next is listen and amplify indigenous voices so prioritize indigenous perspectives seek out indigenous stories and expertise and support indigenous-led initiatives businesses and cultural practices advocate for indigenous rights and systemic change so support policies that recognize Indigenous sovereignty, self-governance, and rights, and hold institutions accountable for implementing the calls to action and combating systemic racism. We're all in an election season at the moment, whether that's federally, maybe, or provincially, or uh, locally. So that's the time now to write to your MLA, your mayor, the premier, your prime minister, and get answers. Next is to build genuine relationships with Indigenous communities. So foster respectful and meaningful relationships with Indigenous peoples and engage in community activities that promote understanding and reconciliation. You can get engaged in Indigenous culture, attend sweats, smudges, round dances, feasts, and ceremonies that are held throughout the year. Make a point to participate in commemorative events for the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation and MMIWG with your family, your friends, your community, to continue learning and finding allies for action. And something that I really liked that Cadmus said was, I know that it can be, people feel um, awkward, maybe is the right word, Mm -hmm. attending things. They don't know what is like culturally appropriate or cultural appropriation. Uh, But what I really liked what he said was about the Maori and in New Zealand and how like there's just two worldviews and everyone has accepted two yeah. worldviews. Yeah. And that's just a part of who they are. And the indigenous worldview is a part of everyone. Mm-hmm. And I just love that. And I was mm-hmm. like, that's very hopeful. Yeah. For our future. And finally, commit to lifelong learning and action. So make reconciliation an ongoing effort by continuously reflecting, learning and actively supporting reconciliation in your personal, professional and community life. In summary, in Jody's book, and much like Cadmus's remarks, Jody calls on us all as individuals to take an active, ongoing role in the reconciliation by educating ourselves, supporting and amplifying Indigenous voices, standing against injustice, building bridges and relationships with Indigenous people, 
and advocating for systemic change. If you can start with even just one of those, then you were going to be going places at a much faster pace. We need to expedite the speed here. So let's do it. We can do it together. We can do it. Thank you so much for joining us today. And that's a wrap as we confront these terrifying but real life statistics impacting women and girls and indigenous people in general. Mm -hmm. Please share this episode, rate and subscribe wherever you're listening and stay tuned for more ways to make a positive impact. Together, we can make the world a less scary place for women and girls. Follow us on Instagram at RaiseHerCo and at scaries.podcast and on TikTok at RaiseHerCo. Remember, change starts with awareness and action and education. Thank you for being a part of the Scaries community and making this world a little less scary to exist as a woman. Bye. Bye.